So game one goes to the Jazz, which is not the least bit surprising. I was talking yesterday about how Steph Curry and Draymond Green are two of the most irreplaceable players in the league with respect to what they bring to the table for their specific team and how difficult it would be to find somebody else to do that. And Luka's in that conversation as well. And, you know, there's there's a lot to the system that Dallas brings to the table that still functions when Luka's not there. I thought Dallas competed like crazy on defense tonight. Credit to them. If they defend like that and Luka comes back, I like their chances in this series. That's a huge plus. On the... Uh, on the offensive end, it's more or less the same type of action that you're seeing with Luka. It's just with less, lesser players running it. This is where that staggering thing comes into the equation that I was talking about. When, when you're looking at Tyrese Maxey and the types of defensive attention and defensive coverages that he's seeing, he is so talented that he can have a certain amount of success in that environment, right? Similar thing has happened with Spencer Dinwiddie and Jalen Brunson this year. Everything's devoted towards Luka Doncic and the way that they uh, and, and the way that teams have to cover him. There's also a fatigue element. Luka Doncic, with his usage rate, is going to take a certain number of pick and roll possessions, or just just we'll call it commanding offensive possessions. He's going to command a certain number of possessions over the course of that game. So the ask that's on Spencer Dinwiddie and the ask that's on Jalen Brunson is significantly lower. Fatigue becomes less of an issue. There's less repetition. Repetition is a huge thing that I talk about in playoff basketball. It's one of the big reasons why James Harden struggles as series goes along. He kind of comes at you the same way over and over and over again and defenses kind of figure it out. So versatility becomes one of the biggest you know, indicators of success. And Luka Doncic has a ton of versatility to the way he attacks. Guys like Jalen Brunson and guys like Spencer Dinwiddie are a little more one-dimensional in their offensive approach. So in larger doses and with more actions on their plate, with more f- with fatigue playing a bigger role and with more repetition, those guys are going to lo- look less effective. And what you saw tonight was Jalen Brunson and Spencer Dinwoody struggling to replicate what Dallas usually does on offense. And switching over to Utah for a second because I think this is rela- uh, very important in kind of understanding why that is. As I've talked about a lot, Utah, I, I call the Utah Jazz frauds, and it's a you know it's kind of a fun word, right? It's it's just a, a you know it's kind of just a, a buzzword in in the sports talking head world when we're talking about teams like this that struggle in the postseason. But there's a very specific reason why I say that. I say that because there is a universe where the Utah Jazz are a very good defensive team, but we see them in certain environments become a very bad defensive team, right? Like. Last year, they were, I think, third in the entire NBA in defensive rating, if I remember correctly. Certainly one of the top few teams in the league. Then they run into the Clippers without Paul George and, uh, or without Kawhi Leonard, excuse me, and just get lit on fire. And they get, I think they had a 128 defensive rating in that series, which is a horrible number. So they're actually a bad defense in certain environments, but they're a great defense in other environments. And what is that environment? That environment is the ability of Rudy Gobert to stay in the paint. You guys probably heard Jeff Van Gundy today say during the broadcast, he specifically came out and said, Rudy Gobert has controlled this game without making a field goal. And he's right. Because in this specific game, with Luka out, the Dallas offense was incapable of getting Rudy Gobert out of the paint. And as a result, he was camping down there all night long. And every time they ran screen and roll and hit a guy with a pocket pass, they had to try to finish over Rudy and they couldn't. Anytime somebody beat one of the bad Utah Jazz defensive guards to the basket, Rudy Gobert was just waiting there. And so nothing was open. There was uh, one of the things that's consistently happened with Utah or with uh, Dallas this year is they've had to play non-shooters in the front court, right? Dwight Powell, not a great shooter, but he's so important to their screen and roll game, he has to be out there. Well, Luka does a better job of navigating that and finding ways to get around Gobert. Dinwiddie and Brunson really struggled with that. Rudy Gobert sat under the basket all night long and it caused a lot of problems. You saw another classic case of playoff defense with uh, with Josh Green. Love Josh Green. Came to Tucson and played for the University of Arizona. He's not making his corner threes right now. So Utah's leaving him wide open. That's even more congestion in the paint. Dallas's offense completely and utterly broke down without Luka. And that's kind of the story of this series, right? Like, what are you going to do? They've tried to go to Bertans for more offense and just relentlessly Donovan Mitchell and Boyan Bogdanovich just kept attacking Bertans every time down the floor. I thought that's what killed them particularly in the third quarter. 
I, I do want to give some credit to the Jazz. They're not a great defensive team on the perimeter, but they did compete today. Again, it's easier to do when you're dealing with Jalen Brunson and Spencer Dinwiddie, but the Jazz did compete. But no, there's really nothing really worth talking about here if they can't get Luka back. Luka is the only thing that matters for Dallas in this series because if he's not there, Dinwiddie and Brunson aren't up to the task. They're not going to be able to get Gobert out of the paint and they're just simply not going to be able to score enough. Even with as good as they are defensively, they're not going to be able to score enough to win this series. So all that matters at this point is they absolutely have to get Luka back. I don't even really see much else to dig into here unless that's the case because Dallas simply cannot keep up in this series without him. All right, last, before we get out of here today, we're going to look at what I thought was an incredibly entertaining game between the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Memphis Grizzlies. So game one went to the Timberwolves. I saw this series being one that Memphis would eventually control and win probably in five or six games, but I did I think that all the games would be competitive. For those of you who listened to the preview, these are two teams that share a lot of similarities. They both play at an extremely high pace. Minnesota plays the fastest pace in the league. Grizzlies play the fourth fastest pace in the league. They both have a ton of long and athletic wings, and they both play extremely hard. That's been one of the interesting dynamics surrounding the Grizzlies all season. They're very good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to undercut them. They are one of the most most talented teams in the NBA. Every time John Morant sits out, it's like, here comes another young athletic guard, whether it's Zyre Williams or D'Anthony Melton or whoever it might be. There's always just another guy that they have on the roster who's young and athletic and super talented. That team has a super, super bright future. But this season, they played harder most of the time. They were a young team, an, ex- uh, 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 an athletic team. They played well at home. They talked a lot of trash. They had like this youthful exuberance to them, which I liked a lot, but it led to an advantage in the effort and energy parts of the game on most nights, which worked great, especially when they would play veteran basketball teams. Well, here's the thing. Minnesota does the same exact thing. That team also plays extremely hard, and they came into this game one And they punched Memphis in the mouth in the effort and energy parts of the game. They had 11 offensive rebounds. I've been amazed by Minnesota's perimeter defense. I talked about this a lot in the series preview. They are sixth in the number of drives that they allow per game, despite the fact that they play the fastest pace in the entire NBA. NBA NBA.com doesn't let you filter for things like per 100 possessions in their tracking data, but if you could... They'd probably be either leading the league or very close to leading the league in preventing drives from the perimeter because they sit down in a defensive stance and they make things extremely difficult for you. I thought they did an outstanding job defending the tri- the dribble drive all game long with Memphis. They stayed in front of Jaron Jackson and made him shoot over the top. I've been telling you guys nonstop, Jaron Jackson Jr., super bright future, incredible defensive player. He's a bull in a china shop offensively, and I thought he would struggle in a playoff environment with a team that consistently built a wall in front of him and slid their feet and made him shoot over the top. They did, and he struggled. Desmond Bain, I thought, struggled uh, generating quality shots. He's not a great shot creator. That This kind of all broke down exactly how I expected for Memphis. It came down to John ja Moran and his ability to create shots. And just like James Harden made the right reads... I thought Ja Morant forced a lot of actions in the paint instead of making the right reads. Crowds of bodies would come in when he would beat people off the dribble. Even with as good as Minnesota is with their perimeter defense, they are not fast enough to stay in front of Ja Morant. He was getting into the paint. But you have two options when you're there. You can either throw yourself into the throng of bodies in hopes of drawing a foul or making a layup, or you can make the easy reads to guys on the weak side and hope that guys will knock down shots. That's not what John Morant did. He just threw his he just repeatedly threw himself into traffic. He did get a lot of calls until late in the game. Then those calls went away, those opportunities went away, and their offense kind of fell dead. That's got to be the biggest adjustment that Memphis has to make as this this series progresses. You know, the Wolves are happy to make those plays. When they get into the lane, they're constantly kicking out to shooters. The Wolves are number one in the league this year in three-pointers attempted and number one in the league this year in three-pointers made. So it's not a big shock that they took 41 of them today and they made 16 of them for 39%. That's the way their offense is designed to function. That's the kind of shot they're going to get. The Grizzlies are not great in that department. They are 23rd this year in three-pointers attempted. They are 23rd this year in three-pointers made and I believe they're 17th in percentage 
percentage. So they're not a great three-point shooting team. So part of this particular matchup is the 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 Grizzlies have to uh, to understand the way this chess match is unfolding. The Grizzlies or the the Timberwolves are sliding their feet on the perimeter and they're taking away a lot of your easy driving opportunities. And when you get into the paint, they are packing the paint and they're giving up shots on the weak side. You have to make those reads when they're there, just like James Harden and Joel Embiid did tonight. That's going to be the story of the game. They went 7 for 27 from 3 tonight, only 26%. That's nowhere near enough attempts for how often Minnesota was overplaying the paint. You have to be taking high 30s, low 40s, 3s in this particular matchup. As this kind of goes along, that's going to be their biggest area of opportunity is finding those three-point shots on the weak side of the floor. Another adjustment that I think the Grizzlies absolutely have to make, they got to get Steven Adams out of the lineup. I will never understand the obsession that coaches have with slow plotting bigs. I dealt with it with Frank Vogel this year and DeAndre Jordan and Dwight Howard in large doses. You know, Sixers fans have dealt with it with going to uh, DeAndre Jordan coming off the bench for them there. Steven Adams in Memphis, it's it, the exact same problem. Jaron Jackson Jr., is every bit capable of playing the five for you all the time, okay? And you can go to Brandon Clark or play small in the minutes that he's not on the floor. You're so athletic around him, and you're so strong around him. Desmond Bain is big and strong. Jaron Jackson is big and strong. Dylan Brooks is as big and physical a perimeter player that we have in this league. You do not need Steven Adams on the floor. When he's on the floor, they're going to run you up and down, and they did tonight. I, I'll have to I'll pull up the box score, but they were big minus when Steven Adams was on the floor. That's an easy adjustment to make moving forward. Get out of your traditional lineups. This is the postseason. You don't need to manufacture stops against the weak opponents in the 82-game schedule. This is winning time. You can't afford to lose another game. You have to get... Uh, Steven Adams out of the lineup and then don't get outworked anymore. You have to find a way to make sure that especially when you're at home, you win the effort and energy parts of the game. You get more offensive rebounds than Minnesota gets. You play better in transition. Those are the areas of the game that they have to control Special shout out to all the role players from Minnesota who made a ton of big shots tonight. Patrick Beverly made a huge sidestep three. Uh, Jaden McDaniels made a huge three out of the corner that kind of iced it. Torian Prince made some big shots. Uh, Mike uh, 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 Malik Beasley, what an amazing performance from him. He is, you know, he's kind of like a depends on when you watch him kind of guy. Inconsistent, not entirely uncommon for players like that with that type of that archetype of kind of volatile offensive shooting guard. But man, he played really, really well as well. This is going to be a very competitive series. I think that the Grizzlies have easy adjustments that they can make, and they are the more talented team. They should be able to swing things, but great first step for Minnesota. Last note on Minnesota before we get out of here for the day. Really impressed with Carl Anthony Towns and the way he bounced back. He had a really unfortunate game against the Clippers. I thought he let the foul trouble get into his head. The way the Clippers swarmed him clearly bothered him in a bunch of different ways. It'd be really easy to shrink mentally from that and under and just feel like it's just not it's just not your night or whatever it is. Cat rebounded and he played extremely well tonight. He was dominant on the offensive glass. Huge part of their offense tonight was the ability to give Carl Anthony Towns the ball at the top of the key and space out around him where he could easily beat guys off the dribble with his face-up game. It's where he got his incredible dunk. It was on a gamble, on a on an entry there to the high post, and he was beating guys off the dribble there. He's so strong, and his ability to draw contact and finish through contact at the rim out of that position was a huge part of their offense. The, what's interesting there is with exception of Jaron Jackson Jr., I don't think anybody on Memphis can guard him on that spot of the floor. So that's going to be a really interesting chess piece for Minnesota as this series progresses. How frequently can they get the ball to Cat there without Jaron Jackson Jr. there? Because even when Jaron Jackson Jr. comes over to help, when Cat has a head of steam, it just doesn't matter like you saw with that ridiculous dunk.